Hi, I'm Peter Tragos, host of the Lawyer You Know podcast and YouTube channel. The saying goes, everyone hates lawyers until you need one. Well, I'm here when you need one to answer your questions and give you insight that you didn't know you needed. Along with my partners, Pete Sardis, the professor, who has a finance and business background, and George Tragos, my dad, and the conciliary, a criminal defense giant, we can answer any questions you have. Hi everybody, Pete Sardis for The Lawyer You Know, and we are back talking about the Sonny Balwani trial. What I'd like to do is kind of give you a brief update on what's going on in court this week, and there were a number of questions that I got uh, from you all over the course of the last number of days, so I wanna go through those and answer as many of those questions as I can. But before we do that, as always, if you like the video, give me a thumbs up. If you're enjoying the series, please subscribe to our channel, and as always, leave me those questions and comments below. All right, let's do a recap. As you know, last time we talked, the government had put on a witness who um, testified ultimately that she had never heard of Sonny Balwani, didn't know he existed, never had any dealings with him. Obviously a bomb to drop on the prosecution. The defense did a great job exploiting um, that witness. But uh, since then, they're still, meaning the prosecution is still focusing a lot on lab type people, meaning lab directors and uh, people that were working inside the labs, and they're going systematically through those witnesses. Again, I believe the government knows that they were successful in at least four convictions uh, against Elizabeth Holmes, so they're gonna go lockstep in the way that they presented that case against Elizabeth Holmes. They're gonna do the exact same thing with their case against Sonny Balwani. Um, I've heard some news outlets talking about the fact that they believe that this case is going slower than Elizabeth Holmes' trial went. But from my perspective, I don't know if the the testimony is actually going slower or if it's just not as exciting to them as the Elizabeth Holmes' trial was. So there's just not as much going on since they've already heard a lot of this stuff uh, in the previous trial. But for the purposes of this particular jury listening to this particular case, they did start to see a number of emails between Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani. And if you remember from the Elizabeth Holmes series, when the prosecution put the evidence on of the text messages between Elizabeth and Sonny, they numbered like something like 12,000 text messages. Obviously, a lot of text messages, but taking into consideration they had a, you know, a multi-year relationship, I don't know if that's really very strange. The key though is the prosecution is starting to develop the storyline that Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani were intimate. Obviously, they were partners not only in the business as CEO and COO, but they were also romantic partners and the people at the company at Theranos did not know about the romantic relationship, not public knowledge apparently at the time. Um, And I think it's important for the prosecution to be able to establish that It's one thing when you are at work with somebody and you may not know what the other person is doing at work, but when you go home and you have an intimate relationship with that person, things are different because what they're establishing right now is the emails between the two parties indicating that not only is the business something that they do from, I'm just gonna make it up nine to five, meaning business hours, but they take this stuff home with them because Theranos is the core, not only of the, you know, of their business, their professional lives, but it's also the core of their personal lives because at the end of the day, all they talk about is Theranos related stuff and how they love each other and some creepy stuff about, you know, how each other is the other person's, you know, the, the, the goddess of my world and just some, in my opinion, very, odd things to say in a text, but maybe it's just, I'm not a a prolific texter, but I guess there are some texts that are coming across where I think the prosecution is trying to demonstrate how mushy and ooey gooey these two were, meaning that this is, I mean, this was an absolute legitimate romantic relationship. And when you go home, you know, you talk to your spouse, your significant other, whoever the case may be, about what's going on at work. In this case, it was just a continuation for Sonny Balwani to discuss business things off the record, off of business hours with Elizabeth Holmes because she was right there next to him in their house. Speaking of their house, we do have some information on that. If you recall, there is a a wonderful Palo Alto estate that Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani moved into. 
Sonny Balwani actually owned the house. It was in his name. They had paid somewhere in the neighborhood of like $9 million for it uh, back in 2013. Sonny Balwani sold the house. And uh, the paperwork, I just saw it, it came public. The transaction happened sometime in late January and, and apparently the sale did close, so the house is gone. Sonny Balwani sold the 5,000, 6,000, whatever enormous square footage mansion that they had for 15.8, that's $15,800,000. So bye bye house. And I can imagine that Sonny Balwani probably doesn't want to live there after everything that's happened in this case. Beyond that, there's really not much happening. The witnesses that have taken the stand over the course of the last couple of days really focused on the fact that they did not know. They had no awareness that Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani had a personal relationship. So that's why the, the text messages are coming out. And again, I think that some of the media outlets are believing this is slow because the government is slowly and calculatedly um, putting these emails out there to make sure that they establish this pattern over the course of a few witnesses. But I think once that happens, they're going to kind of walk away from it and just truck on to other topics. But again, I'll keep you posted as those things happen. Now, now let's take a minute and answer some of the questions that I've gotten over the course of the last few episodes regarding Sonny Balwani. One of the questions that a lot of you guys are asking is, would he have ever been offered a deal? Uh, would it be better for him to take a deal if it was offered? My guess is that at some point the prosecution did go to Sonny Balwani or his lawyers. They did approach them in order to talk about a possibility of a plea deal. I'm guessing at the time that plea deal absolutely involved prison time. It absolutely involved uh, him having to plead guilty to at least the conspiracy count, if nothing else. And there was going to be some sort of requirement from the government regarding loss amount, his role in the offense, uh, the roles of others, and he would have to actually admit guilt. Because in federal court, you actually have to accept responsibility if you want to get credit for, uh, for accepting responsibility on your pre-sentence report for sentencing purposes. Because if you don't admit liability, if you just plea because you think it's the best thing for you to do, but you still want to admit you're, that you're innocent, A, a lot of federal judges won't take those pleas, and B, the ones that will are not going to give you the two or three levels in the reduction in your sentencing score, because in order to get those reduction in points, you have to admit responsibility and take responsibility for your actions. So. I think at some point they did uh, approach him. They probably even prepared a plea agreement for him, some sort of a deal so they could all be uh, in writing so they knew how to, how to present it and what um, the deal encompassed. But my guess is that it didn't work for Sonny Balwani because it was probably still a lot of years of prison time. And at this point they thought, you know, they would roll the dice and see what happens. At this point, and I'm guessing after Elizabeth Holmes was convicted, I'm guessing all plea deals for Sonny Balwani were off. Meaning the only way you could get a deal if you don't want to go to trial at this point is just plead to everything and whatever the judge gives you, the judge gives you. At this point, you might as well go to trial and hope, pray, you know, put on a great defense, whatever the case may be. In the anticipation, the jury will not convict you, hopefully of anything or everything that you've been charged with. So good question there. Next question. Why have the prosecutors never called Tyler Schultz to the stand? He knows a lot about what's going on. Great question. I have two sides to that answer. My unofficial side says Tyler Schultz is George Schultz's grandson. These are people that are politically connected. These are families that are part of an aristocracy, if, if I may use that analogy, in American society. Tyler Schultz will never be forced to take the stand in a criminal case. Um, it's just the way it's going to be. Some people that did take the, the stand, for example, General Mattis, testified for uh, against uh, Elizabeth Holmes. I'm guessing he's going to testify against Sonny Balwani at some point. I, I think that that was a choice that he made based on being approached by the government saying, hey, we really would like to have you. But beyond that, normally when you see, you know, really high powered people or people from high powered families, you know, they're not going to force him to take the stand. The second reason why I think that Tyler Schultz is not going to take the stance is my official position. And that official position is, Tyler Schultz went on a lot of media. He did talk to John Carew. I think there are a lot of bombs that the defense could exploit with Tyler Schultz, basically saying you're a disgruntled employee because either you or you know, your close friend, um, Erica Chung, was you know, in, in a situation where you had bad blood. 
to quote uh, the book uh, title, between you and Theranos, therefore you had an ax to grind, a bone to pick, whatever the case may be, so your motivation for coming to testify may be skewed. That's the, frankly, my official position of why I think they didn't call him also. But listen, you tell me what you think. That's the reality. It's either he's too powerful or comes from a powerful family. They don't want to put him up there because he doesn't want to go up there. Or B, he has too many issues because he did go public. There may be some inconsistencies. There may be some cannon fodder for the defense to really exploit uh, his testimony. And it may just not be worth the hassle of putting him on. All right. Number three. How can you add income into a business if it is not reflected in the bank statements? Great question. The truth is you can't. You cannot just make the income materialize. But what you can do, and this is a reference to the chief financial officer for Theranos that testified that uh, Sunny Balwani made her include income that they were anticipating but had not yet realized into their financial statements. And the answer is, the financial statements can be modified without actually having the bank accounts reflect what's actually in there. It's called an accrual. Uh, is it legitimate in this particular circumstance? It seems like it wasn't because this particular item was booked as income when in fact was not yet realized by the company. And I believe the issue is if you were to go to the bank accounts and do the reconciliation with the financial statements, these two uh, documents were not consistent with each other therein lies the fraud. The fraud is sh uh, making the financial statements show something that the real economics, the dollars and cents, the bank accounts do not. So that's you know kind of how they did it. Because again, realize when you're providing prospectuses, we and you that are getting or receiving these prospectuses, you presume they're accurate, but at the same time, you're not doing an audit. You're not going, all right, I see here that you have a million dollars in cash. Show me your bank account that shows a million dollars in cash balance. You know, that's just not the way it works. Uh, I think people have the right to rely on those financial statements. And that's what most people did. They just relied on it, even though they were not accurate. So I hope that answers that question, but great question. Next, do you think information during Sonny's trial could affect the judge's sentencing decisions for Elizabeth Holmes? Wow, that's deep. Um, I believe that the judge will do the best he can to separate Elizabeth Holmes and Sonny Balwani's trials. We presume that Sonny Balwani's trial will be concluded by September, which is the sentencing date for Elizabeth Holmes. But there is hum a human factor involved. And you know, he's a, a federal district court judge, and this is what he does for a living. So, you know, he's very good at being able to distinguish between this applies to her as opposed to applies to him. But there is a human factor. At the end of the day, we're all people, and it's going to affect, or at least it may have some sort of impact on the way he personally feels. But I don't think Judge Davila is gonna carry that personal feeling or that, um, that information that he learns in the Sunny Ball Wanted trial and use it against Elizabeth Holmes. Frankly, I don't think he has to. I think there's more than enough evidence and more than enough testimony that came out during the trial to give him as much ammunition as he needs to really hammer Elizabeth Holmes if he really wants to do it. Again, when we're talking about financial crimes, what's really moving the needle to the extreme of prison sentences that this case is uh, demonstrating that it is, really is the loss amount. Uh, and because the, the loss amount is you know, in the hundreds of millions of dollars of range, it eclipses the federal sentencing guidelines, meaning there's She's off the charts when you score her. So really the top of the guidelines for her is not the score sheet, which you know pushes life. It really is the statutory max of 20 years. So the arguments are really gonna be, what is fair? You know, What is the appropriate punishment for the person and an appropriate sentence to dissuade others from committing the same crime? And I'm certain, frankly, I don't know Judge DeVille, I've never practiced in front of him, but when you're a federal district court judge, you know, you are the type of personality that can draw the line between your personal feelings and what the law requires you to do. So I think that at this point, it is not gonna happen. Okay, will the fact that Sonny did a sort of management buy-in actually go in his favor or just the opposite? You know, that's a great question. From my perspective, just so you know, Sonny Balwani's current net worth, if you believe, you know, Wikipedia or whatever, you know, online resources, is still huge. It may be close to $100 million. 
So I think what the defense's argument is really going to be is, here is a guy that is worth millions of dollars. Here's a guy that has been a dot-com you know, era you know, um, entrepreneur. He's made a boatload of money. He doesn't need to go into business with Elizabeth Holmes in order to perpetrate a fraud. Now the point is, he becomes the guarantor of one of Theranos' loans to the tune of about $10 million. So he's guaranteed that loan personally. He then buys in, I believe, another few million dollars um, when he becomes COO. And that is supposed to, at some point, convert into stock when and if the company would have gone public. So I think uh, uh, Sonny Balwani does not come on board realizing Theranos is a fraud. But at some point, it is reasonable to presume that, especially since his actions dictate that he was telling the lab folks to change things around and VIPs are showing up, He's telling the financial people, book this uh, you know, as income even though it hasn't even been realized by the company. I believe that at some point when you've got that many millions of dollars at stake, it becomes personal. And I do believe at some point that the little white lies, just do this and you know, everything will be fine when, when, the, when the technology works, kind of snowballs out of control. And that's what probably is going to be the evidence that has been shown here um, in this case. And that's what I think is happening here. Um, that being said, could it backfire on him? And the prosecution's argument is, you've got so much money in this thing, you can't possibly not know that it's a fraud. And the minute you come in here and you're the COO, you know it's not legitimate. You're obligated by ethics and by the law to make sure that whatever's being propounded from this company is honest and legit. Yeah, he's screwed because I promise they're going to find a way at some point to illustrate that everything was not above board. And it's more than just you know, kind of a little bit of a gray area. It is, you know, at this point, we've kind of surpassed gray area. We're into absolute fraud in order to make this work, especially if you go to the Hulu episode where he says, how could you fire me? I told you I would resign when I broke even, meaning presumably when the company goes public and I get my money back. So ultimately, everything's always about the money. So we'll see how the jury uh, picks it up. But I, I see both sides. I think it's probably going to hurt him. Not initially, but ultimately, he's going to have to found out. And I think it's gonna, it's gonna, it is going to be something that weighs heavily on the jury's mind during deliberations. Okay. Uh, keep it up, Pete. Uh, is any of Sonny's family or friends attending the hearings? In Holmes' trial, there was a chorus of family attending regularly. You know what? That's a great question. I have not seen anybody from Sonny's camp other than a fleet of lawyers and him walk into the courtroom. We know he was divorced, uh, obviously, from his first wife before he met or at least started dating Elizabeth Holmes. It doesn't sound like he has any uh, romantic interest that he's tied to, uh, you know, a, a girlfriend, a fiance, somebody more important than just a, a casual, you know, acquaintance. So it's just been him and, you know, the lawyers so far. Uh, that, but if you guys know anything different, if anybody's seen something else, please let me know. All right, curiosity question. Do you believe that Holmes was being honest when she made the allegation that Balwani abused her? I believe that Elizabeth Holmes was subjected to some sort of verbal, uh, emotional abuse. I believe that Sonny is the kind of guy that is overbearing, and I think there was a lot of this is the way you got to be, your, your, your personality is wrong, your hair is wrong, your clothes are wrong. If you want to play this game in a man's world kind of stuff, you need to look the part, you need to deepen your voice because I think that truly happened. And between you and me, how much it affected her, that's personal. But I think it did affect her to some point because she fell into this thing. Uh, she fell into this game. She started drinking the green juice because Sonny Balwani says you have to be healthy and this is the best stuff you can drink, drink it. And she did. So yes, I truly believe there was emotional, psychological abuse. Do I believe there was physical abuse? I don't know. I haven't really heard anything that I can, you know, um, put my thumb on and say, that sounds like Sonny Balwani, you know, beat her up, she showed up to the, the company with a black eye, something like that. I haven't heard that. Not to say that I don't believe Elizabeth Holmes has been physically abused by men in her past. I truly believe that she made an allegation in college I believe it's true, I believe she believes it's true, and I believe it got brushed underneath the rug. And I think that that may have formulated the way she views relationships, especially with somebody like Sonny Balwani, who is so overpowering and domineering, 
based on the fact that he's multiple years older than she is, and he was a dot-com millionaire when she was just a nobody starting up this company. So that's my thought. Again, nothing scientific about that, no legal analysis, but my opinions too. All right, last question. Given that there's something like 98% conviction rate for federal cases in the US, would it be too late for a plea bargain, or maybe you think that he's one of the 2% that gets away with it? The prosecution does have an overwhelming conviction rate, no doubt about that. Um, I think at this point, any deal that Sonny Ball wanted would take would involve many, many years of prison. Uh, I think at this point, he's committed to trying this case. At this point, I don't think the government would offer him any deal other than to say, if you want to save us all the trouble and just plead guilty to all the counts, you know, well, you can do that. Nobody does that. Do I think he's one of the 2% that gets away with it? That's a hard question. I truly believe in the jury system. I believe the jury gets it right more times than not. Again, nothing is infallible, nothing is perfect. But from my perspective, I think at this point he is putting, a, he's gonna, he's, I shouldn't say he is. I believe he is going to put up a fight. I believe there will be a defense. He's not obligated to do that, but at this point the prosecution is still in a place where they're proving their case. And if the prosecution does rest, and the judge does allow the case to go forward uh, for, uh, and overrules a judgment of acquittal at that uh, time, then I do believe Sonny Balwani may put on a defense and hopefully he believes that that defense is gonna be enough to, to take him over the top. Obviously what we know is from the Elizabeth Holmes case, she got a hung uh, jury on a couple of counts, she was not guilty on a couple of counts, but at the end of the day, she did get convicted of four. And it doesn't take four, it takes one. All it takes is one. So the chances of really beating a federal prosecution where you have multiple counts against you really are substantially less because it only takes months. So when the jury goes back and says, eh, let's split the baby, you lose. With that, Thank you very much. I hope you guys have enjoyed this episode. Again, if you do, give me a thumbs up. If you're enjoying the series, please subscribe. And as always, keep those questions and comments coming. I'll keep you up to speed as things keep happening in the Sunny Ball Wani case, and I'll see you soon. Thanks for watching this episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you like this content, please share it with your friends. Make sure you subscribe to our page and like our videos. If you want some interaction, get in the comments and we'll be sure to get back to you. If you want to know any more information about our firm or this page, you can find out in the description or visit tragoslaw.com. We post multiple times throughout the week, so make sure you hit that bell so you can get the notification and not miss out on the next episode.